Let's go before the Father in prayer. Lord God, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us and made us a part of. We can learn from you and all of the, the beauty that surrounds us as we look outside. We're in awe, Lord, of the, the, the good folks that uh, we're, we're here and they were worshiping here this morning. We're in awe, Lord, when we think of uh, what you've done for us. By your mercy and your grace, you've sent your son Jesus into the world to, uh, to die on the cross for our sins, for our own personal sins, and to uh, bring us redemption, to give us a sin to eternal life as we trust in you, Lord Jesus. We thank you. We, uh, we, just, uh, we just thank you. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've given us, and thank you for this church. Pray your blessing on this church, Lord, and all the people, of course. Who are the church. And we, uh, we offer ourselves this morning as uh, the, the body of Christ, asking Lord that uh, you guide and direct, that we'll listen to your guidance and your direction, and your, as we read it in your word, as we follow in your Holy Spirit, that you speak to us, Lord, and uh, guide us along the way, we pray. Guide us in the footsteps of Jesus, we ask you. We thank you, Lord, for many blessings that we have and certainly the the, 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 the provision that you've given us and the provision of healing and comfort and strength and, and uh, with that in mind we, we lift up some folks today and we ask that you will, will be with the family of Danny Spurrier be with them and help them through the time of loss and we pray, pray that you'll replace their grief with, uh, with joy joy knowing that Danny is, is with Pray, Lord, that you'll be with Jeremy Wilbur. He's in, um, back in the hospital. I pray at 96, 96 years old. We lift her up and pray for her healing, for strength, guidance for the doctors, and, and give them that reasonable amount of wisdom to pray. Thank you for being Delma. Thank you that she's a, she made it home this far, or back to Kentucky, or, or to Kentucky. And they just ask that you'll give them the, the doctors the wisdom and so forth for her. Give her a Great amount of strength, we pray, so that she can come home according to your will. Lift up Molly to you, and we thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in her life and, and, uh, and the plan on her coming back in the 19th of February. You will, you will bless her, bless her, she and her family. And Lord, that we lift up our graduates, the graduates here at this church, and pray that uh, you're blessing each and every one. May this be a, a, this, this, uh, this time in your life, we ask that this be such a special time, not only of an accomplishment as they graduate from their, their institutions or schools, but also, Lord, we ask that you will keep them safe in their care as they, they celebrate, as they, they go on vacation, as uh, they go to the beach and wherever. Just keep them in your care. And we ask that your holy angels just surround them and keep them safe according to your will. And God, direct them, Lord, and, uh, from that point. Guide them, and guide them, and direct them as the steps that they take. And may they, their steps be in accordance with your will and for your glory. Thank you, Lord, for, for hearing these and prayers. Bless our worship time together. For we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And now we'll take the one offering.
God's provision and that you provide us all these things. We give you back a portion of that. We ask that you will bless us as we give it. Bless these gifts, we ask. According to your will in Jesus' name. Amen.
You ever been to uh, Hatter's Island? Of course, of course. One of my one of my favorite places to go, uh, I believe, it, and it has been for many years. Although last time it was uh, our, we always got carried away by mosquitoes, which is not unusual in Hatter's Island. But uh, they, they just just followed the hurricane. So it's been several years ago, and uh, well, they, they were there and, and with a vengeance. But um, used, our family used to go there uh, every year, playing the same same building. Uh, my father drove, uh, I believe it was '68 Voyager, something like that. And it was, it was those days when you could go and and uh, ride up right out on the beach. You didn't have to have a permit to do anything. Right, right on the beach, you have to push, let the air down in the tires and take off. They always tell people that. You see people that they I do have to do that. Then you pass it as they were spinning. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, we travel at night, go out at night, going uh, flounder gig. And my father had this uh, inner tube with, with battery in it and had a, had a light on a pole. And, this is for, for flounder digger, digging to go out in the, into the bay. But to get out there, we'd have to travel at night on a, a dirt, dirt road, a dirt, not even a road, it's a dirt path where you could see other chuck, other diggers had been. And uh, we knew pretty well, pretty well where we were going because others had been there and we'd been there before. So it was pretty well marked out. But um, once you, once you park and get, get out into the, the bay, and rarely, rarely the water get above your, your waist, but we'd walk around with the, with the light under the water, look at the flounder so we could just uh, get the flounder. No limit that I know of, <laughs> but um, that, was, uh, that was an awful lot of fun. And, and it, as we would go through the water, we had, I, don't, I don't remember seeing any sharks, but we did a Run across a stingray every now and then. That would scare everybody. And all kinds of other little sea creatures under the under the water of the bay. Certainly flounder every now and then. But um, then we uh, we'd look up and just say, where are we? <laughs> there was no path, none whatsoever, and it was dark as, as could be. And so they had to lift the light up out of the uh, out of the water and and look. And there was there was water everywhere. And then off in the distance, it looked like, yes, I, I think that's the truck. You know, I'm not sure, but I think that's I think that's the truck. So we sort of head back in that direction. And that uh, that made me think. You know, a lot of times we we do travel where others have gone. I like that in the first chapter of Jesus. That was, that was perfect. That was perfect. But we look at where others have, have gone. And just follow the path. You know, where we've gone, we sort of follow that path as well. But um, do we know? Do we know where the Lord wants us to go? Do we know where the Lord wants to lead us and what he has, in, has planned for us? Do we ever ask him? Except to say, Lord, guide me, please. Which is okay to a point, but do we really seek his face? Seek his will in the word his by the Holy Spirit. The Bible is a, is a road map. And uh, much more than that, of course. But in, in many ways, it's, it's, a, it's a road map. It's, it's not a threat. Do this or else. In a sense, it does, the Lord does, does give commands, of course. And he says, these are the consequences of not following his commands. It's a, it's a road map. And it's a, it's a moral guide to show us how to live this life morally according to the, to the will of the Lord. And certainly it's a spiritual guide. And it conveys the, uh, the instructions of, of life. Divine instructions. God's instructions. Wisdom from the very heart of God himself. The Bible expresses God's heart. And so often we, we, uh, we allow the Bible to gather dust, I'm afraid. And uh, even if we open it now and then, it doesn't, uh, doesn't have the, the impact that a true study of the, the Word of God each day 
getting into our hearts and actually following what the Bible says will do. The Bible is a road map for each one of us that the Lord has given us. We don't know steps to take a lot of times, but the Bible is the wisdom of the Lord Himself comes into our, our minds and into our hearts and guides our feet and, and allows us to take steps along the way, even if it's the first step. Allows us to take the steps that, uh, that the Lord has planned out for us. Now, for example, God called Moses to ascend to Mount Sinai. And from there, He gave Moses the Ten Commandments, which were written, of course, on the stone. You shall have no other gods before me, no idols. Now, don't take the name of the Lord uh, your God in vain. Keep the Sabbath day to be holy. Honor your father and mother. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness, don't judge. There's ten of them, ten moral laws. These reveal the very heart of, of, of course, the Bible itself does, but these, of course, the Ten Commandments reveal the heart of God. And this is the course that he has planned for all of us to make. The Ten Commandments actually reveal aspects of God's own nature. Honor father and mother. Don't murder. God would not, would, would not do that. Don't commit adultery. God is faithful. He's faithful with each one of us. Don't bear false witness. God is truth himself. Itself. He is true. His word is true. Don't covet. Our God is completely satisfied with who he is. He doesn't have to covet anything. The Bible is God breathed. God inspired, it's infallible, it's unchangeable, and it is his word. It's his word to be applied directly to our lives. With these things in mind, consider this. Consider this. The Lord is determined to change you and me. He's determined to do that. He's constantly working in our lives to change our lives, to send us in the direction that he, that he wants us to go. Not in the direction that we want to go, necessarily, the direction he has planned for us, and set out for us. He's determined to change you. He's determined to change me. And boy, do we buck the system. Often do we do that. Because we want to go where we want to go, when we want to go, all the time. It's part of being human, I'm afraid. It's part of the sinful condition, of course. But in Proverbs 3, very, very familiar passage. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and you're not in your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will make your paths straight. Who guides you along those paths that you don't know where to go and how to go? And where, where you're, you're afraid that you're going to end up in a, in a bad place or the wrong place or make the wrong decisions? Trust in the Lord and lean not in your own understanding. When the Bible says to trust him, it means to actually trust him, not theoretically. When the Bible says trust him, it means to literally trust him, not virtually trust him. We're not putting our ultimate trust in a concept, in the concept of God or the idea of God. We're not putting our trust in anything like that. We're putting our trust in a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. We're putting our full trust in Him. The Lord and Savior of our lives, believing that He alone will, will, has, has paid the price for our sins, and that we place our trust in Jesus Christ, that He's done that, the promise is there. We have the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. As you seek to live life, when you wonder which way to go, when you beat the, the steam legs, or when you get into deep water, you wonder where you are because of all the darkness, all the obstacles. Seek the Lord. Seek the Lord because He is light. Seek His light and He'll direct you along the path. In Galatians 2, verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, and yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. I trust in the Son of God. I live my faith in the Son of God. That's what we, we must declare. May 
got this from a, a very uh, gospel coalition. It's a true story. True story, a man had been sentenced to prison because he was a thief. While there, he was converted and became a new creation in Jesus Christ. I've seen lots of them. I've seen lots of, uh, of prisoners that have been converted. And they follow this path in many ways. When the time came for his release, he knew he'd be tempted to return to his old way of life. His friends would try to draw him back, and he knew it wouldn't be easy to break patterns of the past. They do that. They're afraid of that. And rightly so. The first thing this man wanted to do upon his release was to go worship. So on his first Sunday morning, he slipped into an old church building and sat down in the back row. As he looked around, he noticed a plaque inscribed with the words of the Ten Commandments, and his eyes fell on the words that seemed to condemn him. You shall not steal. He thought, well, that's the last thing I need. He knew that. I know my weakness. I know my failure. And he struggled on having to break free from that old way of life. As the service progressed and the man kept looking at the words of the plaque, they seemed to take on a new meaning he hadn't seen before. In the past, he'd only known these words as a forbidding command, you shall not steal, which it is. But now, seeing God was speaking these words as a marvelous promise, you shall not steal. It seemed God was saying, you are a new creation in Christ. And for this reason, you won't go back. You won't go back to your old way of life. The Holy Spirit lives in you and will lead you in a new life in which you will no longer steal. You have the ability now not to steal. And you won't. Just follow the Holy Spirit. Allow the Holy Spirit to guide you. Allow the Holy Spirit and the Word of God to be the light that shows you the path that the Lord wants you to take. This is having a trusting and prayerful attitude. In Romans 6, even so, consider, and this is the bottom line, come to this, come to this decision on your own by reason, but consider this. Consider yourselves to be dead to sin. The battle is in the mind, of course. In, uh, in this Christian life, it's, it's in the mind. Consider yourselves, come to the conclusion that you're dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. The Lord will help you every step of the way. Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, that is, his feathers, and under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and bulwark. So we have to abide in the shadow of the Almighty. We have to be with him. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Now, in Gospels, in Gospels, Matthew, in Matthew's Gospel, unless you have dyslexia, yes. uh, in, in Matthew's Gospel, chapters 5, 6, and 7, these are known as the Sermon on the Mount. They're very, very familiar. You're well aware of those. It's sometimes thought of as Jesus' declaration of the kingdom. This is the declaration of the kingdom Jesus was essentially saying in chapters 5, 6, and 7. In these, Jesus gives us instruction on how to live this life. It's the road now in life. It's the path that we must take. In chapter 5, you see the Beatitudes. I'm not going to read them all. Blessed are the Lord and Spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. They should be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth, and so forth. 
Then chapter 6, the Lord's Prayer. We see the, the Lord's Prayer. We also see it in, in the Gospel of Luke. We see the, the purifying sign. I'll let them not go there. Chapter 6. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life. Don't raise your hand. Anybody worried about your life? <laughs> From time to time. Yes, we all do. Don't, we? don't be. That's, that's what Jesus was saying. About worry, this worry thing. Two words. Don't be. Don't be worried. Here's a summary in general terms of what we so often worry about and pray about. Do not be worried about your life, Jesus said, as to what you will eat or what you will drink or for your body as to what you will put on. We worry about money, what's for dinner, and how do we look. And then other things too. Jesus said, is not life more than food? And the body more than clothing? Look the birds of the air. But they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? You're always worried about clothing. <laughs> Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil nor do they spin. Yet I say to you, that not even Solomon in all of his glory clothed himself like one of these, Jesus said. But if God so clothes the grass of the field which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? You have little faith. Do not worry then, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. In fact, that's what the Gentiles live for. Gentiles, in this sense, meant the unbelievers. This is what unbelievers live for. If you, uh, if you know Jesus Christ and you remember when you were a follower of Jesus Christ, then you know what I'm talking about. That's life right there. But the Father knows you need all these things. But seek. It says, but seek. That means through prayer, through reading his word, through the choices that you make. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. That does mean you and me worry about it. Then, chapter 7. Chapter 7 begins with Jesus admonishing his disciples and us not to judge. He comes the scripture that was read this morning. We finally get to the scripture that was read this morning. Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 7, ask. And the, the tense, uh, I can't remember what the name of the tense is, but it doesn't matter. But, what, but I'll tell you what it says. It says, it says keep asking. Keep asking, and it will be given to you. Seek, that is, the tense means keep seeking. Keep going. Right now, don't stop. And you will find. Knock, keep knocking, and it will be open to you, Jesus said. Here's the problem with prayer. I guess I could rephrase that, that title in my mind. Sometimes it's the problem with, uh, with our prayer, I guess. Sometimes our prayers are just are sort of half-hearted. They're perfunctory. They're, they're quick because you have something else to do, prayers. They're, they represent a, a minimum of effort and a minimum of for reflection. And because of our often half-hearted and often superficial, sometimes shallow attempts at prayer, we actually display a misalignment of God's will. We're out of line with God's will. Sometimes our, our prayers, which are not exactly uh, full, uh, full of, the, of our coming from our hearts and, and, and are sort of aimed at God and hope that everything's going to turn out all right, it really displays a, a, a misalignment with Him, with His will. And when we're not allowed with or in agreement with God's 
real that can be real disbelief. And along with selfishness and lack of love for God and another thing and all those things. Half-hearted prayers point to a misalignment of God's will, which is a direct result of a lack of fellowship. What the Holy Scripture is about, by the way, is the fellowship of the Father, of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit who is who He has sent, our Triune God. A lack of fellowship with Him, and we lack that closeness, that intimacy with God. We essentially set Him aside as the guarantor of the prayer. <coughs> Matthew seven, verse seven. Ask, keep asking, and it will be given to you. Keep seeking and you'll find. Keep knocking and it will be open for you. Don't stop. Keep meeting with your heavenly Father. Keep praying with the Lord Jesus. Keep speaking with, listening to, and obeying the Holy Spirit. Martin Luther said, or who did believe the cross of Reformation, once said, if I fail to spend two hours in prayer each morning, the devil gets the victory through the day. I have so much business I cannot get on without spending three hours daily in prayer. John Wesley prayed two hours per day. George Whitfield, great evangelist, prayed at least three hours a day. One hour in the morning, one in the noon, and one in, at, uh, in the evening. He was a great evangelist. Ian e. Bounds, who wrote the, uh, several books on prayer, prayed three hours daily. John Welch spent at least seven or eight hours daily alone with God in prayer and study of the Word. Goodness, I'm not saying those are the ones you should follow. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying spend some time with the Father. Spend some time with the, the Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, speak to Him. Listen to what He has to say to you. Fellowship is absolutely the key to this life that we live the spiritual life that we live the spiritual life with Jesus Christ. Leaning your hands and pacing the floor and saying, what am I going to do, what am I going to do, doesn't have one bit of fellowship with the Word. And you're not giving it all to Him. <coughs> and Matthew 7, again, for everyone who keeps on asking, he receives. He who seeks, keeps seeking, finds. And to him who keeps on knocking, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give what's good to those who ask him? In everything, therefore, you do this. In everything, therefore, Treat people the same way you want them to treat you. Well, this is the law of prophets. I go up to the law of prophets referred to in Romans 13. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. If there's any other commandment that's summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love is no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And what does that have to do with, it, with our life today? Well, look at, the, look at the news anytime. You see the world is falling apart. It's like our culture is falling apart. It's unbelievable. Now, I'm not going to go down the list. I could, but I don't want you to be discouraged at all and, and go, go in that direction. But believe me, we do these things. We follow after him. Follow the path that he has taken. We'll change, our, we'll change the world. At least our world. And uh, the Lord will use you in, in a way that you, you uh, could never imagine. Verse 14 of Romans 13. Romans 13, 14. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's like sinking into your clothes. It's like relaxing into your clothes. It fits so well. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And make no provision for the flesh. Don't feed the flesh. That's when I'm talking about food. But don't feed the, the, the fleshly spirit. The main point of prayer is this the main point is to change us. It's not to change.
thank God. You might want to confess God that kind of thing. He already knows. He just wants you. He wants me. And he wants us to come to him with a fellowship with him. And he, and he, wants, he wants us to keep asking, keep seeking, keep asking, keep knocking, so that we will be transformed into the image of the person, into the image of Christ, really, to be more like Jesus Christ. The problem with our prayers is all, too often we're me focused instead of God focused. Habakkuk 3.19, the Lord God is my strength and he has made my feet like nine feet and makes me walk upon high places. The Lord God is my strength. I can go in so far with my strength and boy, I get tired. We get tired. But we go, we go, we go on in the Lord's strength. 1 Peter 5, therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him. He cares for you. Back to Matthew 7. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. What if you took one of some of those paths that are off, 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 the, off the road or that uh, there are paths? You, you might end up in the ocean. You might uh, end up in a, uh, a dead end, sand dune, all kinds of places you can end up. Or in the, the water, you can, up, you can walk for miles, I guess, passing through. But you can walk a long way, but you didn't shine the light to see where you were. But there's a narrow, just sort of a narrow path to take there in Paris. And there are not many roads to lead there. It actually, it's just, you can it's just one. That's what the Lord is saying to us. There's one path. The path is Jesus. And Luke it says uh, Jesus is the, is the gate. He is the, the gate, the gate. And uh, so there are very few who can find it. Jesus is saying, this is very important. Jesus is saying, you're choosing where you want to go. Our, our, our paths have consequences. They lead somewhere. You're choosing where you want to go. Each of, each of us is choosing. When you leave the parking lot here at Beck's Church, we're going to go to the left or to the right. You don't have much other choice. Unless you go across the parking lot there. And then I'll circle around and come right back to the road. You'll either go to the left or to the right. And then you'll, you'll hit another connecting road or, or roads as you go on. In fact, many of you have already made that, that decision, which way you want to go, and you leave this place. And that's good. That's a, that's a good thing. But you're choosing which direction to take, which road to take, is no more real than the choosing you'll make regarding your spiritual life today. It's very real. The choice that you're making in your spiritual life. Your spiritual life today tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. But know that just as your choice of road will lead to your destination, so too will your choices in your life lead to consequences spiritually. And I pray you're blessed to have each of us, each of you, and myself included, each of us, to choose the right path. Who is Jesus Christ? You've heard us before. I'm going to end with it, but uh, you've heard it before, and I'm going to say it anyway. A man's daughter asked the local minister to come and pray with the father. When the minister arrived, he found the man lying in the bed with his head propped up on two pillows. An empty chair sat beside his bed. Heard us before. The minister assumed that the old fellow had been informed of his visit. I guess you were expecting him, he said. No, who are you, said the father. The minister told him his name and then remarked, I see the empty chair. I figured you, you knew I was going to show up. Oh, yeah, the chair, said the bedridden man. Would you mind closing the door? Puzzled, the minister shut the door. I have never told anyone this, not even my daughter, said the man, but all of my life 
I've never known how to pray. At church, I used to hear the pastor talk about prayer, but he went right over my head. I abandoned each attempt at prayer, the old man continued, until one day, about four years ago, my best friend said to me, Johnny, prayer is just a simple matter of having a conversation with Jesus. Here's what I suggest. Sit down in a chair, place an empty chair in front of you, and in faith, see Jesus on that chair. It's not stupid, because he promised I'll be with you always. Then just speak to him in the same way you're doing with me right now. So I tried it, and I've locked it so much that I do it a couple of hours every day. I'm careful, though. If my daughter sees me talking to an empty chair, <laughs> she'd either have a nervous breakdown or send me off to the plane park. <laughs> the minister was deeply moved by the story and encouraged the old man to continue on the journey. Then he prayed with him and anointed him with oil and returned to the church. Two nights later, the daughter called to tell the minister that her, her daddy had died that afternoon. Did he die in peace? He asked. Yes. And when I left the house about two o'clock, he called me over to his bedside and told me he loved me and kissed me on the cheek. When I got back from the store an hour later, I found him dead. But there was something strange about his death. Apparently, just before daddy died, he leaned over and rested his head in the chair beside the bed. What do you make of that? The minister wiped a tear from his eye and said, I wish we could all go like that. Well, I wish we could all live like that. And I pray that we do. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord God, we give you all the praise and all the glory. Lord, uh, you're there. We, uh, we have an inkling of uh, your great love for us when you look across the empty cross, and, the, and you consider you, Lord Jesus, who died and rose again from the dead. Father, we have an infant of that love, Lord, that uh, sometimes we just don't uh, seem to have time to, to really meditate on that, on your great love for us. Well, help us to spend time with you, Lord. It would remind us, remind us of that empty chair to know that um, our life is not empty at all. Our life is being fulfilled every single day as we seek your face. And help us to seek you, Lord. Even though we can't see you, we know that you're there because you promised such. So Lord, bless us, we pray, as we seek your face in a spiritual manner and as we continue to love and to serve you with all our hearts in the days, the, the weeks, months, and years that we have left. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand now and sing that old familiar hymn, number 202, Amazing Grace. <laughs>
Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Amen.